Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to continue our work on this microscope as it has allowed us to capture some really wonderful images, especially of integrated circuits and various specimens. Now, in the previous videos, we've done the LED replacement and upgrade of this microscope. We have designed a custom power supply that you can see all the way back there that controls the LEDs of the microscope in conjunction with the built-in functions of the microscope itself, making it all a nice self-contained unit. We've looked at DIC microscopy, bright field and dark field and polarization, and a whole bunch of different interesting imaging techniques. Now in this video, I have upgraded the microscope to have an XY automated motorized stage. And of course, this has a motorized Z axis. And with the appropriate controller and some software that I've written, we can do Z focus stacking and XY image stitching. And this allows us to do a whole bunch of very interesting image captures that normally are not possible with a single capture of these microscopes. So let's take a look. Now, motorized XY stages of microscopes can be extremely expensive because these are servo-based with very, very fine encoders, allowing you to move in micrometer steps, even sub-micrometer steps, as we will see. As a result, if you want to buy a new one, it's going to cost thousands of dollars. Now, I found a broken one that I managed to repair and put together. It came with its own joystick. It also has a controller box, which is back here. We're going to take that apart and take a look at it as well. And all of those have to work together and be compatible. The controller is also connected with the CAN bus to the back of the microscope itself, allowing you to be able to control the entire thing with a single serial port and the appropriate software you can write, of course, on the computer. Now, this is really convenient because now we can move the stage of the microscope with this joystick. And it does have a, an optical encoder here, which allows you to move it really, really fine. You can't even see it moving now, but of course the image is moving micrometers at a time. And you can do that both in the X and the Y axis. And the Z movement itself is also motorized and you can move this. So when you move this knob down here, you're actually not moving it mechanically by gear connections. You're sending encoder pulses to the controller and the controller moves this using a servo as well. So this basically now has XYZ servos. So here's the structure of the X movement, which is the same as the Y movement. This is just easier to show you this one. There's a DC motor in here and an encoder in the back of it and a PID controller wrapped around the entire structure inside the controller. That PID controller is always monitoring the precise position of the DC motor using the encoder. So when this thing is energized, I actually can turn this because if you turn it, it will resist that movement. There's a PID controller around it and it will constantly correct it. As a result, the instrument always knows the exact location, no matter what the mechanical pressure is on the system. And this is pretty important for something that needs to move sub-micron distances, of course. So it's a lot of very precise measurement and, of course, mechanics. Now, if I move it left and right, you can see how it moves. There's also two limit switches in here, which you can move around, but you can also set softer limits, and so it can't go beyond a certain amount and damage itself. If I zoom in a little bit more and use the fine movement, you can kind of see it move around using the optical encoder. So the movement is really, really accurate. It's very satisfying to move this around because it works so smoothly. Now this had a lot of problems. I had to spend m many hours taking it completely apart and putting it back together. It was actually put together incorrectly. It looks like someone else had tried to mess with it at some point and it was missing a bunch of screws. Now all the PID controller part of this is inside the MCU28 box. So we'll have to take a look at that too because that also has some issues before I could get it repaired. And you can see the other axis movement. So the entire structure moves this way and then the intersection moves that way. And the slide can be put in there in the middle and everything has to be balanced of course otherwise you go out of focus. Now interfacing a really good microscope to a really good DSLR is always challenging because you still need some optical interface between the two of them and you want to preserve the dynamic range and the contrast and the wonderful images that the optics of the microscope can capture into let's say a full frame sensor. So at the top we have a Nikon camera, it's a mirrorless, obviously has a full frame sensor there so you really want to expose the entire area of that sensor so you can capture as much light and of course take the full resolution of the camera. Now the photo tube that I'm using with this particular microscope is one of those ones that either puts the light into your eyes or puts it into the camera. There's some advantages to that because it's not splitting the light into two so it preserves all the photons essentially into one or the other but you can look at them at the same time which is not a problem in my setup. I tried many different interfaces here and all of them either give me some bad coverage of the sensor but they had some uh, softness to the images that it was captured. It, it really wasn't working. And finally, I said, I'm just going to go with a good expensive solution. This is from LM Scope. It's an Austrian company. And it just really does give you the lowest vignetting and barrel distortion or any chromatic aberration in the image. And it does a very good job at translating that. And they helped me find the appropriate components. And you can see that there's a direct Z mount 
attachment to the cameras. It keeps this distance as short as possible, essentially making sure that everything is as, as good quality as it can be. So this by far gave me the cleanest image. We just have to look inside the MCU28 before we make some images. So here's the back of the MCU28. As you can see, there are a lot of interfaces. It actually can control three axes of motors. In this case, I'm using X and Y because the Z is directly built into the microscope. Here's where you can control using the joystick. There's two CAN buses, which I'm one of them I'm using with the actual microscope body. And here's a COM port in there if you need to use that for controlling it directly. A whole bunch of other controllers here that you can have stepper motors and mirrors and so on that you can control with this. It's it really built to be an all-around solution for a very complex setup. As a result, these things probably were very expensive when they were originally introduced, and they're still somewhat expensive if you look for one on eBay. And here's what's inside the MCU28. There's a lot of replicated circuit in here because every motor controller is independent. X, Y, Z are controlled with these three drivers over here, a lot of relays and a lot of independent samplers and processors and memory and so on built into this. Now, back when these things were built, the processing power was quite rare. So you couldn't do a lot of these things in software. So all of this has a combination of background software and background hardware that are running, freeing up the interface, the CAN interface, for you to send a lot of commands. So you don't have to boggle up your software or different parts of the instrument, and you can control them all at the same time. This has a lot of flexibility. You can set different PID parameters, the acceleration of the motors, all different kinds of soft and hard limits and how these motors move around. Really totally customizable with the appropriate software commands. I had to figure all that out. It wasn't so straightforward, but once you get kind of a good hang of it, you can do a lot with these. Big power supply sitting here at the top. The rest of it is really nothing unusual, as you put, which is exactly what you would expect to get from something that tries to create an abstraction layer around a whole bunch of motor controllers. Again, back then, these things were not so straightforward. Nowadays, we have so many CNC machines and 3D printers that this abstraction has been put into so much hardware. But it wasn't like that back then, so it's pretty nice to see. So let's take an example here. This is an ASIC that I designed many, many years ago while I was a student, so it's okay to share it a little bit more. This is a 30 giga sample per second track and node amplifier. These are used in front end for very high speed ADCs, for example. So as you can see, we have multiple metal layers, as it is common with these technologies. This is a 0.13 micron CMOS technology, if I'm not mistaken. Now, if I go all the way up to the top focus, you can see that I can focus on the pads, and I can focus on the text at the very top layer. And as I go further down, the focus plane moves further in towards the bottom layers, and at some point, the bottom metal layers are the ones that are in focus. So as a result, even at a 10x magnification of the lens, which is 100 overall, I can't get all the layers of this chip to be in focus at the same time because we're spanning you know, 10 or 15 micron and that is beyond the depth of field of this particular lens. Now the depth of field of any lens can be relatively easily calculated. It's a function of its magnification, its numerical aperture, as well as the resolving power of the sensor that is capturing this image, in this case the Nikon camera. You can use a formula and it will give you the depth of field. So I went ahead and I incorporated that into the Microsoft control software that I had written before. So here's the Optidus software. So aside from all the control that I had before, I now also have an XY stage control built in. You can see I can move the stage by one micron steps. The resolution is actually 0.5 micron. And I can move the Z focus as small as 0.05 micron, which would make sense because you can use very high magnification here. Now the camera automatically, or the software automatically, calculates the depth of field of the lens that's selected. So we have a 10x lens selected here, and you can see it's calculated the depth of field of that lens to be 10 micrometer, and the field of view to be 2.35 millimeter, which makes sense. This means that anything that is taller than 10 micron is not going to be in focus in this configuration that I have with the lens that I have. This is very similar, by the way, to any camera that you would use. It's also a function of the aperture ring, which is now almost open, so it's not in, in the equation in this case. So if I were to change the lens to a new lens, I'm going to put this onto polling, so it's constantly sampling what's happening. If I turn it into a 20x lens, of course the image is going to be more zoomed in, and you can see now the depth of field is now only 2.5 micron, so it's four times smaller, which means that we're going to need even more stacking of various layers to get a full focus. So we can try it in this example. If you look at the image again, let me minimize that so it's not in the way. Right, so let's focus on the top metal. Look, it's a nice and sharp focus. The little tiny dots that you see are actually on the surface, a finished surface oxide layer of the dye itself. We go further down, and slowly these metal layers are coming to focus. And if I continue, the lower metals eventually come into focus down there. 
and ultimately everything's out of focus. So with appropriate number of images, I could do focus stacking and I could bring them all together and create an image that has a very, very deep depth of field even though the lens itself doesn't support it. So we can try that. And the way it works in the software that I have written is really is quite straightforward. So basically I tell the software when the image is at its highest focus point. I also tell it when it's at the lowest focus point by setting these two points. And it's going to calculate how many images the camera needs to take in order to do the focus stacking. I can also tell the software what the top left and the bottom right image that I want to capture is. And it's going to do also multiple images across the X and Y to stitch them together. And then what you end up with is an image that's wider than the field of view of the lens and much deeper depth of field of the lens. And that's going to be, you know, it could be 50 or 100 images to do that, but it's going to give you some beautiful results at the end. So first we're going to switch the camera into image capture mode. This is in movie mode. Okay, when you switch that, it's going to bring a whole bunch of additional information on the screen that is used for image taking. There it is. So let me minimize that again. So we are taking pictures at 1 20th of a second, which is good because we can capture a lot of light and where exposure looks good and I'm using the highest settings of the camera that I can. So using this now, if I go back into the software, I can connect to the camera. Let me turn the polling off, no need to do that. Connect to the camera, and there it is. These, these, by the way, should be green, but because I'm using a chroma filter, it's basically looking through. If I move this around, you can see that they're basically transparent in the, in the way this is set up. So now that it is connected to the camera, I can do a single capture, like so. Right? It takes one picture, and the picture should show up here any second. There it is. So it works. Now let's set that up and take a whole bunch of captures. So first, we're going to go to the highest point, which is around here. We're going to tell the software that this is our highest point. We're going to go to the lowest point, which I think is somewhere around here. We go beyond that. There it is. So we have these two Z points. I'm going to verify to make sure this is correct and it looks like it is, and it needs 21 pictures to focus stack here. I'm not telling it anything about moving the X and Y, it's not necessary, it's the same idea. And now we can go ahead and say, begin the stitching. So it's going to take one picture at a time. It will take a little bit of time because the, it has to pause in between and copy the files, but it's just counting towards 21, like so. It's going to be finished in a little bit. And here are all of our images. I can step through them. You can see we have a whole bunch of images to work with now. Now we need somehow to combine them. Now you could write your own software to do this, but there are a lot of really good software that you can buy or even free uh, on the internet. I just picked one randomly that had good reviews and I bought a license of it so we can try it out. So the software I'm going to use is called Helicon Focus and I have put all of the 21 images we've captured. I'm playing around with some of the settings, but this is just the highest uh, amount of computation that I'm throwing at it that I know how to do at the moment. So if you go render, it's going to go through all the images. So first it goes through them in one direction, trying to figure out where the images are in focus. As you can see, it's going through it. And you can see different layers come into play. And then it's going to go all the way backwards too. And it's going to create a complete hybrid image. It's pretty cool to see it do this. Now one other thing you can do when you do this is that you can estimate the actual depth of every layer. So you could create a quasi 3D picture. And in fact, it does that. You can already see how much better this looks and how everything is in focus. Let's go ahead and try and save it. If I go under saving here, I can create a 3D picture out of this. And here's the 3D image. It does a pretty good job. It knows that it figures out that the top metal layers like the pads are higher than everything else. The little individual metal fills show up as little tiny blips. The inductors, these ones, are, are much, much lower as they are supposed to be. This is correct, of course. It's not perfect, but it works really well. You can play with the settings and create some additional effects. But I can also save the image, which is what I'm interested in the most. And here is our focus stacked image. So if I zoom in, it looks pretty good. It does a really good job. And it does sometimes make some weird artifacts like here. But overall, you can play with the settings and see what happens. Actually, some of this artifact is because this colors are green, so you're looking through the image. That's actually not from the software. It's just the artifact of how I'm capturing it. But it looks pretty good. And this image, remember, is impossible to, to make like this. You cannot see it even with your own eyes. You have to do some processing to it. And doctors are different layers stacked up. Very cool. So even at low magnification, this is using the 5x lens, so total magnifications of 50, when the structures are not planar, you can get even large things to not be in focus at the same time. So 
For example, if I want to look at the bottom of the substrate, the bottom of the substrate is here, and everything else is completely out of focus in that case. And I can go all the way to the top, and you can see the dye to be in focus now. This is from a Keysight synthesizer. And we can go even further back. This is a 2.5x lens, which gives you a magnification of 25, and you're looking now really, really high up. Even in these situations, you could run into similar problems. Now, you could put this into dark field, which is going to give you a very different kind of image. I'll switch it to dark field here. And give it a bit more light. And you can see the structures totally differently, which is really pretty. And here, even in this magnification, doing some focus stacking would help because you could get the wire bonds to be completely in focus. Here you can see the ceramic pieces, everything here. Look at these cool inductors and everything that's hand assembled, totally custom made. We've done a reverse engineering of this module when I was doing that repair. But even for something like this, focus stacking would help a lot. And images are, are really, really beautiful. And here's a focus stack image. This is only six images, so you could do more if you wanted to get even more focusing. And it looks really nice. And one of the nice things about taking images versus taking a video is that you can set your shutter speed to be very, very low. And in dark field, it's hard to capture enough light to do this. So it, it works really well in that situation, especially when you when you can let the camera run for a while. You get these beautiful, beautiful images. And there you have it. I hope you're enjoying my journey into microscopy and all the different features we can add to it. I'll do some more videos where we do proper focus stacking of different things and taking a look at the integral circuit. This would be great for our future videos. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.